This is, um, we are continuing with tafsir, the tafsir of Surah Al-Hujurat. We are in ayah number six. And this is a very well-known ayah. In fact, one of the most, one of the most often uh, discussed ayahs in this surah. And because there's a very remarkable story behind this ayah, and there's a lot of things that we can learn and that, are, uh, that can be derived, a lot of ahkam that can be derived from this ayah. This is ayah number six. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you people who believe, in ja'akum fasiqum bi naba'in fatabayyanu. If there comes to you any kind of news, then Allah says, fatabayyanu, do your due diligence, inquire about it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, an tusibu qawman bi jahalatin. In case you are wrong to others, uh, unless uh, in case you are wrong to others, unwittingly, meaning that you do not do it intentionally because you did it out of ignorance. And perhaps later on you will be regretful over your actions. Now, what does this ayah mean? So we have to go back again once again, the ba- uh, we go back to the life of the Prophet to understand this ayah. This is after the, uh, the battle or the expedition of Bani al Mustalaq. And after the expedition was over, as usual, the people, you know, men and women, they became prisoners of war and they were distributed amongst the Muslims. At that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he married the opposing leader's daughter and her name was Juwaydiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha. After he married Juwaydiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, the Prophet alayhi salam, he gave da'wah to the opposition leader, his name was Harith ibn Dirar. So he gave him da'wah to Islam, he converted to Islam. When the Sahaba saw that the Prophet ﷺ has married within the opposition, and not only that, but he, the opposition leader has become a Muslim, they themselves, they let go of all the prisoners of war. Now, by the way, one thing I have to mention is, when we talk about the, the marriages of Rasulullah ﷺ, it was, Many people, they say that the Prophet ﷺ, he got married to so many women out of his own lust and desire. And that is not true. In fact, if this man, for argument's sake, if this man was, let's just say, after his lust and desire, then why do you think he married a woman who was almost 15 years older than him? Think about it for a moment. If he was truly after his desire, he was 25 when Khadija radiallahu anha was so much older than him. This shows that this was not a man who was after his desire. In fact, we also learn from the cases like Juwaydiya radiallahu ta'ala anha that a lot of times in order to bring peace to the communities, in order to bring peace within the, the newcomers, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sometimes he would marry within them to bring some kind of peace. So we find with all the, all the marriages of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they were either inspired by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, like in the case of Aisha Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha, or a lot of times in order to bring peace, in order to connect with the other tribes, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he will get married. Anyway, coming back to the story. Harith ibn Dirar made a commitment to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you send a messenger of yours on a yearly basis and I, as a community leader, I will collect everyone's zakat and I will present it to your messenger, whoever you send, and they, you can distribute the zakat accordingly. So one year comes around, Harith ibn Dirar, as usual, based on his commitment, he collects everyone's zakat. Now, on one end, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is preparing and he's trying to find someone and he finds Walid ibn Uqba. He says, I want you to go to the tribe, uh, tribe of Bani al-Mustalaq and go there and collect this year's zakat. Now, there are two different versions to this story. The first version says that Harith ibn Dirar was waiting for that person to be sent by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but there was some type of delay on the part of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, perhaps, and Walid ibn Uqba did not come in the appropriate time as he was expecting. So Harith ibn Dirar and his entire tribe they left their area and they were coming towards Medina, and Walid saw that these people have left their area and they're coming now. Something important to note here, because this is part of the story. If you go back to the times of Jahiliyyah, 
Walid ibn Uqba's tribe and the tribe of Bani al-Mustaliq, they were at some serious odds. They, were, they did not like each other. So keeping that jahiliya you know, mindset, meaning that the relationship from the jahiliya times in mind, they're still aware of that. When Walid came and he saw that these people have left and they're coming to his way, he went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all he said was that, Ya Rasulullah, these people, they have refused to pay their zakat. And they are out to kill me. Because once again, he's thinking that from the Jahiliya times, our tribes were at odds. Therefore, they're leaving. They're coming my way. They perhaps want to kill me. And he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he gave this false information. At that time, Rasulullah wasallam he sent a person that no one is going to mess with. Khalid bin Walid, okay? No one's going to mess with Khalid bin Walid. So he says to Khalid bin Walid, I want you to go and find out what's going on. When Khalid bin Walid was on the way to that tribe, he met Harith ibn Dirar. And Harith ibn Dirar said to Khalid bin Walid, where are you going? Khalid bin Walid said that I'm coming your way, I'm heading your way. He says, why? He says, you refuse to, you refuse to pay your zakat. He goes, we did not refuse to pay our zakat. In fact, we did collect our zakat. We, was wait, we were waiting for a messenger from the Prophet ﷺ to come and collect the zakat, but that person never came. That is one, one version. The second version is similar, that he came all the way there, and when they came out to the outskirts of the city, he seeing that, he went back and said that these people have refused to pay their zakat. Anyway, in both cases, Rasulullah wasallam when he heard this, and he could have taken some serious action against them, that is when this ayah was revealed. Ya amanu in ja'akum fatabayyanu. When there comes to you any kind of news, when someone informs you of something, you cannot take action right away without doing your due diligence. Because if a person does take action, without due diligence, without inquiry, without investigation, without research, then perhaps they will do something that they will be regretful about it later on. This is what the ayah is saying. And as you all know that there are different qira'a of the Qur'an, this, the one that we often recite, Hafs bin Asim, Hafs an Asim, it is, an tusibu qawman bi jahalatin fatabayyanu. Fatabayyanu, comes in the word bayina. Bayina means clear evidence, meaning that whenever you do your investigation, you have to come across some very clear, tangible evidence in order to make a ruling in a situation. When someone comes to you and they give you some news, some information, they tell you about something, till you don't have clear evidence about anything, you cannot take that person's word and you have to do your due diligence. And another qira'a, the word for, instead of fatabayyanu is fatathabbatu. Fatathabbatu also means making sure that something is absolutely firm. The dalil is absolutely firm. And once again, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us to go through this process? Because a lot of times we may act in an in a ignorant manner and hence the results will be very, uh, will be very negative. Now, the, the most important thing I will say that is to be learned from this is, this happens often with many of us. Someone comes to you and says, did you hear someone say something about this? Or did you hear this? I've had people come to me and say, oh, did you, Imam, did you hear what was said on, on the mimbar? Do you hear what the, what the khatib said? And it was completely wrong and so forth. And of course, the human nature says, let me react right away. But subhanAllah, we have to always, whenever someone tells us anything, without us reacting, we have to tell them that I need to go back and I need to see the evidence. And not only that, but I need to listen to both sides of the story. I need to sit down with both parties and hear them out. And that is why in our deen, especially when it comes to you know, matters that are of dispute, it is very important that we keep in mind there's a very important rule and principle within our deen and that is which means in English that the person who is the plaintiff, okay? So for example, if I'm claiming, for example, Hakam, 
Brother Hakam here, he has done something wrong to me. That makes me the plaintiff. That makes Brother Hakam the defendant. He's defending himself from the claim that has come to him. As a mudda'i, I'm the one who's making the claim. I have to provide the evidence. You understand? I have to provide tangible evidence. And if I cannot provide tangible evidence, then وَالْيَمِينُ عَلَى مَنْ أَنْكَرُ The person who is the defendant, in this case Brother Hakam, he being the defendant, if he swears upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have not done anything in this kind of situation, then he is absolved and this entire case is dismissed. This is how things work. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in our community, in our society, that is no longer the case. And let me be very honest and truth, uh, be very truthful about this matter. In our community today, the basis of some news being, um, being acceptable or not, or how do we decide in our community who's guilty and who, who's innocent? Wallahi, unfortunately today, it has come down to gender. A woman cry, cries out foul play, subhanAllah, everyone drops everything, she is the victim. Okay, this happens. And we see that a lot of times the men could be the mazloom. And in this case, when the man says something, everyone is quiet. Now yes, there are cases where the man is the zalim. I've come across many cases like this too. And truly the woman is a mazluma. There are many cases like this. There are many and tons of cases like this. But the point I'm trying to make is, our decision that who's right and who's wrong, who's guilty and who's innocent, cannot be based on gender. This is what's happening in our society, unfortunately. It is based on evidence. It is based on proof. It is based on dalil. You make a claim and you don't have any proper tangible evidence. And by the way, even if you go to a court of law of today, right now, there are some certain kind of evidences that are simply not acceptable anymore. When you talk about text messages and so forth, in some courts, they're no longer admissible in a, in a court of law. Why? Because of Photoshop, because of AI, even recording sometimes can be, can be uh, compromised. So the thing is, the, point, the most important thing is that when someone comes to you with any kind of news, be a man, be a woman, then in that case, instead of us reacting, instead of us saying, He's wrong, she's wrong. He's right, she's right. It is important that we look at the evidence. And a person has to do their due diligence. Now, if you don't even have the time to do your due diligence, and you don't know the whole story, then it is always better. It is ahsan to stay quiet. Simple as that. I'll give you some very, you know, just very um, practical examples. There are times in our Muslim community when a person, a Muslim person, man or woman, they get arrested. And subhanAllah, there's so many rumors, there's so much news, there's so many things spreading within the Muslim community. And in a situation when I don't know, when there's not enough evidence to say who's right and who's wrong, it is not allowed for anyone to say they are right and they are wrong. We cannot, we're not in that position. How do we know that? Again, from another story of Rasulullah wasallam, known as the Qissatul Ifq, the slander against our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. If you look at that story, you have the munafiqun who made a claim against our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And it was Aisha's word against their word. Was there any evidence, uh, any of that type? Wallahi, there was no evidence. And because there was no evidence, this was the dilemma for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That here the munafiqun are making a claim against my wife. My wife is making a claim against them. It's one's word against another, another person's word. Yes, there are many sahaba, many others who used to be around Aisha radiallahu anha. They testified to the innocence of our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. But that is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa at the very end, he kept on staying quiet in this matter. And he kept on collecting evidences, kept on talking to others. And at the end, what did he do? He went to our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and said that if you have truly committed the sin, then make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you have not, then you have nothing to worry about. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the revelation exonerating 
our mother Aisha of any wrongdoing. And that is where, of course, everything became very, very clear. But you have to ask yourself, what was the situation of the Prophet ﷺ before those ayat came down? Whatever happens in our Muslim community, this is why this ayah is revealed and put in this surah because this surah talks about communal ethics. It talks about how to manage your affairs in a community. So when there is something that is spreading around and I don't know all the details, I don't have all the details to say that he is guilty or she is guilty or he's innocent or she's innocent. Wallahi, it is wrong. We don't have a claim. We should not be saying anything till I have not seen all the evidence. Yes, there might be some who have seen all the evidence. But if I don't know all the evidence, I've not sat down with both parties, I don't see everything in front of me, I cannot make a judgment in that matter. Because a lot of times those judgments are going to be based on jahala. They're going to be based on ignorance. And as a result, when we make a judgment based on ignorance, then we have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. So this is how we manage these kind of things when it comes to our Muslim community. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep the peace in our Muslim community. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq to handle our affairs based on the Quran and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen rabbal alameen. Wa jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما